Good morning, congregation. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us therefore rejoice and be glad in it. Not only is it the day the Lord has made, it's also the Lord's day, uh, the festive day of rest. And so we welcome you, uh, members and also visitors, as well as those who listen in through the radio or the internet ministry, as we seek to worship our Lord uh, throughout the day. We begin our service with a call to worship from Psalm 122, verses 1 through 4. And there the psalmist David speaks for the people of God when he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord." And so we do indeed congregate ourselves together, gather, assemble ourselves together to express corporate praise and thanksgiving to our God. And as we begin our service, uh, let's do so with a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, innumerable are the reasons by which you are to be honored and praised and glorified. We thank you for this day of rest, for the Lord's day, a day in which we can assemble ourselves together hearing you call us to enter into your presence in a special way, to give thanks to the name of the Lord our God. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that as we begin this Lord's Day, and as we begin this service, that you would clear our minds and quiet our hearts, that all of the thoughts and concerns of the week gone past and also of the week that lie ahead might be temporarily paused, and that we might meditate upon your goodness and your glory and your majesty that we might respond appropriately with a sincere expression of praise and thanksgiving. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll then begin our service with a song of praise. If you'll take your Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to selection 122B, we'll stand and sing all of the stanzas, the four stanzas of 122B.
and especially when we worship our Lord, we do confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heaven and the earth, and he greets us and welcomes us as his people uh, this morning with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we begin a new week, we are reminded of God's will for our lives, as we find that expressed in the Ten Commandments as recorded in Exodus chapter 20. And so we read there uh, the will of God for our lives as expressed in the Ten Commandments. And we remind ourselves that these ten words were written by God himself on tablets of stone, uh, symbolizing the permanency uh, of these ten words. And none are added to them, and none are taken away from them. And so this is a comprehensive summary of what God would have us to do in our lives. So we read that God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet neighbor's house, you shall not covet neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And Jesus Christ in the New Testament summarized these Ten Commandments with two. The first and the great commandment is that you and I are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second commandment, similar to the first, you and I are also called to love our neighbor as ourself. And we'll respond to the reading of the law of God with song. We'll remain seated, but we'll take our Trinity Psalter hymnals and turn to selection 350. We'll sing the three stanzas while remaining seated of selection 350.
And indeed, as we live our lives by faith, we do acknowledge our sins, but we hold to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as accomplished on the cross as the basis of the full and the free forgiveness of all of our sins. Our faith holds especially to the Word of God, as, for example, we find in Colossians 2, uh, verses 13 and 14, our text assuring us pardon. And there the Apostle Paul writes, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Just simply note there in that passage the central focus upon the work of God in Jesus Christ and the central essence of what redemption is, the forgiveness of sins. And in that text and all throughout Scripture, the focus continually remains upon the work of the cross. And so to know God in a peaceful relationship of fellowship demands that we know Jesus Christ and that we know something of his work as that work was accomplished, especially in his atoning sacrifice upon the cross, because it is only there that we have the forgiveness of sins And it is only through that work that we then have the opportunity to come boldly upon uh, our Father's throne also in congregational prayer, uh, to which we turn at this time. Let us pray together. Lord God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, early in the morning hours, uh, we seek your face in covenantal worship. Uh, We come to express our thanksgiving to you, for you are a great God, and you have done, and you have promised to do great and wonderful things. Uh, You have done wonderful things in creation and in the continual work of providence as you uphold all things and govern all things uh, by your almighty power. Uh, We see the seasons begin to transition, and we know that you are the God of history, and so we also thank you that uh, our lives are not left to chance or to fortune or to some random expressions of luck, but that our lives are in the hands of our Heavenly Father who does all things well. Uh, We thank you also especially for the work which you have accomplished in and through your Son, Jesus Christ, the redemption of our bodies and our souls. We thank you, O God, that there is forgiveness with you that you might be feared. And again this morning, uh, we come and we confess our sins, but we do so not uh, in the depths of despair, but we do so knowing that there is salvation for sinners in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this also causes us to express gratitude and thanksgiving to you, for you have forgiven us much, and so we love you much. And we ask that you would enable us to express our love with lives of covenantal faithfulness, not in order to obtain your favor, but because we are the objects of your favor. Uh, Father, we pray that you would raise us up as your children in sanctity and in maturity, uh, that our faith, our hope, and our love might daily increase. Uh, We ask then, O God, for the work of conversion to be accomplished continually within our lives, that by the power of your word and by the work of the Holy Spirit, we might continually renounce our own selfish wills, and that we might with eagerness and with a zeal follow after your will, which alone is good. And so we ask also that you would bless us as we seek to follow your will with all that we stand in need of for our earthly pilgrimage. Uh, We pray, Lord, that you would continue to grant us safety as we go about our day-to-day activities. So often we say, tomorrow we will do this and we will do that. We will go here and we will go there, but we do not know what tomorrow brings. And so our prayer is that you would lead us and guide us, that you would watch over us, and that you would grant us all that we stand in need of. Uh, We do thank you, Lord, that you have remembered our needs in the past week by refreshing the earth to a measure with rains from the heavens. We ask that you would continue to remember the needs of the crops and of the fields and that you would grant a successful harvest in due time, uh, that we who are so dependent upon your hand might uh, have our daily bread. Uh, We think of our vocations and of our callings here in this life, and so much is involved with uh, all that is needed for the transactions to 
uh, be conducted so that we might have what we stand in need of, shelter and food and clothing. We pray, Lord, that you would bless all of our endeavors, but also give us a spirit of contentment and a spirit of wisdom that we might use all that we have and all that we are uh, to serve you and to glorify you and to honor you. Now, Father, we ask that you would grant us also spiritual strength and protection, especially against the evils that are so rampant within our culture, but also that lurk within our fallen natures. Uh, Lord, we think uh, of the various perversions that impact our culture and that also confront us, and we ask, Lord, that we might stand fast and firm upon the truth of your most holy word. Uh, We ask especially for the young people that you would protect them and grant them uh, a singleness of heart that they might follow you all the days of their life. Uh, We pray, Father, for the needs of this congregation. We think of those who are undergoing treatments. Lord, would you grant success to the medical procedures and the treatments that they might be restored to a fullness of health. Uh, We pray also for those who are shut in, uh, widows and widowers who experience times of loneliness. Comfort them Uh, with the fellowship of the triune God, but also with the fellowship of your people. May we be a congregation that has compassion and empathy for those who are in times and in circumstances of need. Uh, We think also of families that mourn. Uh, We pray, Father, for the Voss, the Van Wyck, the Van Coten family, as they have laid loved ones into the grave within past days. Lord, comfort them with the gospel the gospel of eternal life through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel promise of the resurrection of the dead. Uh, Father, as we think upon uh, all of the activities of the congregation, uh, there are some who have made plans to be joined together in marriage, and we ask that you would bless their plans and prosper them and establish godly homes, that they might enjoy the uh, fellowship that there is within marriage that they might establish godly homes for the well-being of society, but especially for the furtherance of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that uh, there are those who are expecting children to be born uh, in due time, and we pray that you would form and fashion these little ones well in their body and in their soul. Uh, We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon uh, the college students of this congregation as they make plans in the next weeks to return to their places of study. Uh, Lord, bless their studies, watch over them, protect them, and Lord, cause them to gain wisdom and to buy the truth and to never sell it. Uh, We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon those who are uh, mature in their years and those who will commemorate birthdays, Lord willing, within this week. We think especially of Dennis Roseboom, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness shown to him throughout all the years of his life, and we ask that he might raise an Ebenezer of thanksgiving along with his family. And Lord, uh, our times are in your hands, but those are good hands in which to have our times. We pray also this morning that your kingdom might come through the gospel labors of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, both within this congregation, but also throughout the entire breadth of the world. And so, Lord, bless the preaching of the gospel, that it might go forth in truth and in display of spiritual power, that sinners might be converted, that saints might be edified, that Jesus Christ might be lifted up, and that the triune God might be magnified and glorified, that the angels might rejoice, and that time would hasten on to eternity, Uh, when Christ returns, ushering in the new heavens and the new earth, for which we so eagerly await. And so, Lord Jesus, again this morning our prayer is come quickly. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll then turn to our song of preparation this morning. That's taken from Selection 438 in the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. We'll stand, if able, and sing all four stanzas of Selection 438.
This morning in your Bibles, we would direct your attention to two passages. First of all, a reading from 2 Timothy 3, and in the Pew Bible, you can find this on page 1,367. And then the words of our text this morning will be taken from Jeremiah 6, verse 16. And again, in your Pew Bible, you can find that on page 874. Uh, We're taking uh, a temporary pause from our series, and we're looking at an isolated text in connection with the college student farewell, but also some of the other events that are happening within the life of our congregation. We have had the opportunity by God's good providence to hear many professions of faith uh, over the past months, and we also anticipate hearing more professions of faith uh, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, And so we commemorate these things. Uh, And also there uh, are expectant mothers in our congregation, and we rejoice with God's covenant faithfulness. So uh, in connection with all of these events, we thought it fitting uh, to look together this morning at our text from Jeremiah 6, verse 16. But we want to read first from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here now together the reading of the Word of God. But know this that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, disapproving concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. For out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then the words of our text taken this morning from Jeremiah 6, verse 16, and again in your pew Bible, that's on page 874. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, statistics can be confusing, statistics can be debated, And yet, generally speaking, statistics can be revealing. Uh, I want to quote some statistics by way of introduction this morning. A recent Barna study reports nearly two-thirds of U.S. 18 to 29-year-olds who grow up in the church have withdrawn from church involvement as an adult after having been active as a child or a teen. Now, I want to reread that. Nearly two-thirds of U.S. 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up in the church have withdrawn from church involvement as an adult 
after having been active as a child or teen. Now imagine in your mind's eye, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 100 young people standing and now take two-thirds of them away. So if you had in your mind's eye 10, take six or seven away. If you had in your mind's eye 100, take 60 of them or perhaps 70 of them away. And that's what the statistics tell us concerning young people and the church. Another study reports only approximately 8% of the population attends church multiple times in a week. And over the last approximately decade, those who never attend church has risen from 14% to nearly 25%. Now these things sadden us, but they ought not surprise us, because this is exactly what the Apostle Paul spoke of in 2 Timothy 3. And this is also exactly what was happening in the days of Jeremiah. There was a great falling away from a sincere, active exercise of what we might call true religion. And these things are increasingly real in our culture, what many define as a postmodern culture in which there are so many who are fulfilling the prophecy, you might say, of Paul in 2 Timothy 3, always learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Always learning in their own estimation, always learning in their own opinion, but never really coming to an experiential personal knowledge, the saving knowledge of the triune God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, This morning, after the conclusion of the formal service, after the benediction, we'll have the opportunity to say farewell to our college and university students. Now, I want to define that word carefully because farewell is not be gone. Farewell is we'll never see you again. At least we hope that's not what we're doing this morning. Farewell, it's a compound word, of course. It speaks, first of all, of fair. And and fair has the idea of journey, to make a journey. And so we recognize that along with all of us, but in a special way, uh, our, our young covenantal people are on a journey. And for our college and university students, their journey will lead them for the next year and the next years into a place of higher academical learning. And what we say to them as a congregation is, this journey that you are embarking upon, we pray and we hope that it goes well. But what exactly would that look like? What exactly would a well journey look like? And then also, how exactly do we accomplish a a, a well journey? As young people make professions of faith, as young people uh, in a couple of weeks begin another year of schooling, as young people perhaps having completed their formal education, as young people transition into their, their life calling, their life vocation, how do they fare well? Well, we would submit to you, based upon our text, that for someone to fare well, they must seek and follow the old paths. And so that's our theme this morning, taken from Jeremiah 6, verse 16, old paths. And consider with me this morning, first of all, the need for the old paths, and then secondly, the identity of the old paths, and then thirdly, the blessing of the old paths. So imagine... And we're all embarking on a journey, and we say farewell. And that farewell is found in the old paths. And using our text to guide us in our consideration, notice the need for the old paths. Jeremiah uses the word of the Lord, and he says, stand in the ways. 
Notice ways there is plural. Stand in the ways. And this shows us already the need for the old paths is because of what we might call the crossroads of life. And young people, you especially, you, you stand in the ways. You stand at the crossroads of life and, and you have perhaps over the last year or years you have considered that there are, there are many different possibilities for how you proceed through life. Maybe even uh, as you get ready to embark upon another year of schooling, you have had the opportunities to consider, well, what school should I attend? And, and there are many possibilities. Uh, and perhaps Upon the completion of our formal education, we look upon the vocational calling and we say, well, well, what vocation should I enter into? What career should I enter into? And again, the possibilities seem almost endless. The latter teen years and the early 20 years are crucial years, are critical years, are vital and important years in the setting of one's life, in the deciding of the course that one's life will take. Stand in the ways. Because at this point in life, you, you have achieved a certain level of maturity and then a certain level of independency. And yet, if I may humbly, pastorally remind you that although you have attained a certain level of maturity, there is still, there is still remaining immaturity. And so it's especially important for persons who have come to these years of discretion, these years of young adulthood, as they begin to make their own way in life, so to speak, uh, to soberly analyze which path will I take, which direction will I go, uh, which avenue will I proceed down. Our text speaks of the ways in the plural, and indeed many, many, and this is not just to the young people, this is to all of us, but there are many voices that are heard, beckoning unto us, encouraging us, calling us, come this way, go do that thing, pursue this avenue. Uh, You can think of all of the talking heads within our culture. You can think of all of those uh, who set themselves up in lecture halls, or through uh, some type of social media avenues. And they say, this is how you ought to live. And someone else will come along and say, no, that's not how you should live. This is how you ought to live. And then there will be the pundits and the authors and the peers and the professors all beckoning unto us. And what can actually come about is a confusion because of the chaotic voices that are heard. And we don't simply want to neglect the reality of the voices uh, that we are confronted with. But we want to say, when you stand upon the ways of life, know that you are at a crossroads. I had the opportunity some time ago, many years ago now, uh, to visit Union Station in Washington, D.C., Now, I have to admit that busy cities are not necessarily uh, my favorite experience. A Union Station, travelers coming and going, all sorts of destinations, all sorts of avenues. In a similar way, I also had the experience many years ago to try, and I stress try, to navigate the subway system in New York City. Innumerable numbers of people coming and going. And and you can look at the map of the subway system and you can see that you can take, well, this journey or or you can go to that destination or you can get off at this stop or that train. And, and, And that's something what it is for our lives and especially for you young people. You stand, as it were, in Union Station. You stand before uh, the subway system of life and there's all different types of branches. But in contrast to everyone going their own way, there's also this reality. The need for the old paths is found in the consequences for eternity. There are, of course, in life many different roads to take. You can think of education. Some pursue 
higher education. Some enter into vocations uh, more promptly. Some go here for college. Some go there for university. Some enter into this career. Some enter into that vocation. And so there are all sorts of different journeys. And yet we must reckon with the fact that all roads lead to the same destination, eternity. Is this not what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7? The dust will return to the earth as it was. Speaking about there, our bodies, formed as they were by the almighty power of God from the dust of the earth, the dust will return to the earth as it was. And the Spirit, referring there to our spiritual component, our spiritual element, our soul, the Spirit will return to God who gave it. You see, life, Life is not just simply some video game uh, that it says game over and then you walk away and say, well, wasn't that enjoyable? And life is not just simply uh, leading to some exit uh, into some type of nothingness, but rather life as we live it out day by day, week by week, and year by year leads all of us to this final destination when time gives way to the eternal And families within our midst have had the solemn responsibility in this past week and within past weeks to lay the mortal remains of a loved one into the earth as their spirits have departed through physical death. And every single one of us is on a path that leads to the eternal And I would emphasize that while there is this one unified, inescapable destination, there is a great divide. Jesus Christ himself spoke of this in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So there are many different ways through life, yet all of these ways lead back to the eternal. And in the return to the eternal realm, there are two pathways, a broad way that leads to death and a narrow way that leads to life. I ask all of us, I ask the young people, to consider whether or not these things are biblical truths. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are. And that's why I believe it is so important that we heed the words of Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see. That word see has perceive, understand, know. Know the old paths. You notice the text continues, and ask for the old paths where the good way is. So given uh, what we've said in regards to our first point, the need for the old paths, we transition then uh, to our second point, the identity of the old paths, because if we're going to see, if we're going to give careful, deliberative thought to which avenue we ought to take throughout life, uh, we do well to understand the identity of the old paths. The word old simply has this, the idea of a long-term duration. The old established patterns. And this, we would say, first of all, is the path that was revealed to the patriarchs. Patriarchs being the fathers, the covenantal fathers. And we think here of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. We think here of the people of Israel, as the Lord sovereignly chose them as his covenantal people. And what did the Lord, notice the covenant name there, what did the Lord do for Abraham? What did the Lord do for Isaac? And what did the Lord do for Jacob? He revealed to them the way of his salvation as he chose them from out of the fallen mass of humanity as his own special chosen people. And he led them and he guided them And he showed to them the way of life everlasting. And we need to be reminded of the danger of what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. And what exactly is chronological snobbery? C.S. Lewis goes on and he defines it this way. 
chronological snobbery is the uncritical, the unthinking, the unperceiving acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age. It is to say, the voices that we hear, the contemporary voices, they must be right. Simply because they're contemporary. Simply because they're the voices of our day and of our age. And Lewis goes on and he says, chronological snobbery is the uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date is on that account discredited. So the voices of a former day are dismissed simply because they were from a former day. And Jeremiah would say, don't fall into the dangerous trap of chronological snobbery, thinking that whatever you hear today is right simply because you hear it today, and whatever you heard yesterday is wrong simply because you heard it yesterday. Now, if you uh, are inclined, you can cross-reference with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Because we're saying that the old paths are these paths of long time duration, these ways of truth, these ways of life revealed to the patriarchs, including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenant people of the Lord. And in Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, Uh, you'll notice here uh, that the Lord is speaking through Moses to the covenant people. And Moses says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, remember the days of old. Do you notice the warning against what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. And then Moses goes on and he reviews the redemptive work of God. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples. And if you drop further down, notice uh, what Moses says there in verse 45, 46, 47. Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said to them, Set your hearts on the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law, for it is not a futile thing for you because it is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. And so this is exactly what was to to happen. The fathers, and of course the mothers, the covenantal fathers were to hand down the old paths of the redemptive work of God from one generation to the next generation so that the children would learn the paths to walk through this life into the realm of eternity from their fathers, from their grandfathers, and from their great-grandfathers. And the people of Israel were to be perpetually warned against chronological snobbery. Don't get into the promised land and look around the surrounding nations and go, oh, the Moabites have neat ideas. Oh, the Amorites, they have neat ideas. Oh, here's Baal. Oh, here's these gods. Oh, here's this way of doing things. Everything our fathers taught us must be obsolete. Come, let us follow after something new, novel, innovative. No, no. Consider the ways and see and ask for the old paths, the time-tested, the true paths, which are the good way. And if you go back uh, to the words of our text, you'll notice that there is this further description, the old paths, where the good way is. The good way of life is found in the old paths of the redemptive work of God as revealed by the Lord to the patriarchs. Good means the highest goal uh, for human existence, the time tested and true. And and if, again, you want to cross-reference a passage, you can go to Isaiah chapter 8, and Isaiah helps shed light on what the good way is in, in verse 20, and really for context in verse 19. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? So what was happening in Israel uh, was the the new voices were coming and saying, oh, 
You don't need to listen to that old-time religion that was revealed by God to our fathers. Let's go to the mediums. Let's go to the wizards. Let's go to those who whisper and mutter. And then Isaiah sounds this solemn call to the law and to the testimony. We might summarize that to the Word of God. Go back to the Word of God. Why? Because if they, and they can be comprehensive, they can be the mediums, they can be the wizards, they can be uh, the academic professors, they can be the cultural experts, they can be the talking heads. If they do not speak according to this Word, it is because there is no light in them. No light. If someone says to you, says to me, this is how you ought to live your life. This is what you ought to strive after. This is the way you ought to go. And if we honestly take our Bibles and analyze what they say, and if what they say contradicts what the Word of God says, then we can know there is no light in them. Then why in the world would we ever follow them? Why would we ever seek for some redemptive element within them? And if you're young, if you're old, if you're anywhere in between, Test everything according to the Word, the Word of God, and go back to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this Word, it is because there is no light in them. And the good way, of course, as revealed in the law, as revealed in the testimony, is the way of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus Christ say in John 14, verse 6? And and this strikes against our pluralism of our culture, in, in which so many people are saying, oh, there's all sorts of ways back to the eternal, back to God, back to harmony with Mother Nature, or whatever else, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he went on and he clarified, no one comes to the Father except by me. And now all of us have a decision to make. Do we believe the words of Jesus Christ? to the law and to the testimony. Consider the words of Jesus Christ and ask for the old paths, the good way, the good way which many of our ancestors taught us and many of our ancestors followed. You see, this good way, this old path, is a well-worn path that many a saint has traveled to reach what John Bunyan called in Pilgrim's Progress the Celestial City. And now there are many new paths that lead people astray. But the old path is the path of Christ and Him crucified. And this path is the path that all of those witnesses that are recorded in Hebrews 11 have followed. And you can read Hebrews 11 and you can imagine these travelers making their way throughout time and throughout history, walking towards the celestial city. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. On and on and on the list goes. And Hebrews 12 then says, the innumerable company of witnesses that have gone before. And the exhortation to you and to I is to follow after those same old paths because there is blessing to be found there. In our third point, there is this blessing. The words of exhortation are always accompanied by a word of promise. Then you will find rest for your souls. This blessing is rest. We considered this last Sunday morning, of course, with Jesus Christ's great invitation, come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't want to repeat what we said last Sunday morning. 
Just simply allow me to point out that this rest is a similar word to what is used in Psalm 23, verse 2. He leads me beside the still waters, waters of rest. Peace and calm is what is envisioned here with this rest. Quite loosely, you might translate it that you will find a safe space for your soul. And now, isn't this exactly what our culture tries to sell us? Also in our colleges and universities, you can find a safe place. Now, what they mean is a place free from any intellectual disagreement. They mean a safe place from any type of call of the exclusivity of Christianity. And the young people of our culture are flooding such safe places, but they'll never find rest for their souls there. Because rest for one's soul is only found in the old paths of the religion revealed by Jesus Christ to the covenant fathers and mothers of Christ and Him crucified. You want a safe place for your soul? I, I can't really imagine someone saying, no. No, I'm not interested in a safe place for my soul. You want a safe place for your soul? It's found in the haven of rest. It's found in the harbor that is Christ and Him crucified. It's found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And I am pained by our culture's confusion. Not just by our culture's confusion, but because of the impact that our culture's confusion has upon souls that are weary and heavy laden. Souls that are tossed to and fro. Souls that are being lied to. Saying that you will find rest here or you will find rest there. Pointing away from the harbor of rest. Saying that you'll find rest in your own self-fulfillment. Saying that you'll find rest in some type of postmodernism, Saying that you'll find rest by doubting everything. It's a lie. Don't buy it. There is only one place in which you and I find rest for our soul. It's the old path. It's the good way of Jesus Christ and Him crucified alone. But in order to obtain this blessing of rest for our souls, you notice that there is the imperative to walk in the way. You know, sometimes when we're traveling, we'll stop at a rest area. And and I'll look at the the maps that are sometimes still there, hung up on the wall in the rest area. And and of course, there's the interstate system and then all of the other other roads. And sometimes you, you notice oh, look, that road leads here or that road leads there. That isn't a value of any real benefit. You need to actually go down the road. It will not help us at all if we just leave this morning and say, "Hmm, interesting, he identified the old path, the good way. That was insightful. We need to walk in it. And walk here is symbolic of the entirety of our life. To walk. And, And here... I can think of nothing better other than Enoch. Boys and girls, do you remember Enoch? Enoch walked with God. He lived a life of faith. He followed the old paths, the good way. He walked with God. And then it says he was not. At least that's the way I memorized it when I was a kid. He was not in the sense that he no longer lived this earthly life, but he lived the heavenly life. And with everything within me, I simply implore for all of us, walk in the old paths where the good way is. Because it's the deadly danger of arrogant ignorance that says in verse 16 at the end, but they said, we will not walk in it. The people of Israel, in the days of Jeremiah, they were going to do some walking. 
They were going to walk themselves into captivity. They were going to walk themselves into the most brutal experience ever. And why? Because by and large, they had refused to walk in the old ways of the old paths. So all of us have a decision to make. Will we walk in the old path? Or will we walk in a new way? I can only say this. If you and I choose the old paths, the good way, that is the same as the narrow way that Jesus Christ spoke of that leads to eternal life. But if we say, I think I'm going to chart my own path, I think I'm going to go down a new road, I think I'm going to veer off the covenant revelation of the Scriptures, then sadly but solemnly I have to tell you, you are going to wander. You are going to wander all throughout life down the broad road that leads to destruction. So don't fall prey to chronological snobbery. Don't scoff at the time-tested way of your fathers. Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us a clear instruction from your word. We simply pray for humility of heart and clarity of soul that we might stand in the ways and consider and see and understand and perceive that there is a good path that leads throughout life into the experience of eternal life and that good path is the path that has been revealed throughout the ages, especially as we find it now for us expressed in the Word of God. So give us a recognition of the authority of the Word and of its benefit for life and for eternity. And incline our hearts, Lord, to walk in the way of life everlasting. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, then we turn to our song of dedication, which will be from Selection 207. Uh, we'll stand to sing the four stanzas, after which you may be seated again, all four stanzas from 207.
Then at this time, the deacons will receive our morning tithes and offerings that will be given for the Christian Education Assistance Fund. After that is received, we'll sing our doxology from Selection 563, May the Grace of Christ our Savior. And then we'll have the benediction, and after that we'll ask you to be seated again, and then we will invite the college and university students forward uh, for their farewell uh, before we have the moment of meditation and the postlude.
And now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God with the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And again, at this time, you may be seated, and we would invite our college and university students to come forward. And I don't do this just to embarrass you. I know some of you perhaps are a little bit awkward about coming forward. Uh, We simply do this, come forward if you would, so that the congregation can see you, identify you. As our members who will be heading off to college and university, uh, to the so-called halls of higher learning. Uh, I want to just leave you, and I know that time's already gone, but a a few words. We as a congregation, uh, we will pray for you uh, in the weeks and the year that lie ahead. Uh, I simply ask you to do a couple of things. Find a good church home to participate in while you're away. Don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. When we do call you, when we do email you, call us back, email us back. We're going to keep in touch going forward. Um, Don't forget about us, and we won't forget about you. And I want to leave you with one closing exhortation and then have a word of prayer with you. So Proverbs 4, verse 7, 8, and 9, and this is really my prayer for each of you. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. Wisdom is not the same as knowledge. Uh, Wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. And wisdom has at its very heart and very center uh, the fear of the Lord. So my prayer is that And all of your getting, as the proverb continues, get understanding. Exalt her that is exalt wisdom, exalt understanding, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Uh, And so to each one of you in the upcoming year, by the Lord, by his word, by his spirit, get wisdom and get understanding. Now let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we ask for your blessing upon each young person here, uh, also those of this congregation who are not here, uh, who will be departing for uh, their year of higher education. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would indeed give to them a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding. Uh, Give them a zeal to be faithful and participation of a local church. Uh, Grant them a willingness to communicate uh, with family and also with this congregation, including the overseers, the elders of this congregation. We pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, these young people in the days and the weeks that lie ahead, that you would bring them to an increasingly greater spiritual maturity, that they might have a fear of the Lord that governs all aspects of their life. So look upon them uh, in your grace and in your favor and bless them both now and forevermore. Amen. So now during the postlude, we'll ask you to exit into the narthex where you can greet uh, the congregation.